consultant endocrinologist with Idea Clinics and Idea Foundation. So uh, today I'm just going to be talking about uh, a few words about Idea Foundation under under the uh, auspicious guidance of uh, Professor Prakash Sahai uh, and uh, under which this program is being held. So Idea Foundation is a non-profit organization. It is mainly aimed at uh, uh, undertaking any academic activities uh, which actually increase the, um, uh, the awareness or the, uh, the academic interests in the doctor groups. And it conducts seminars. We conduct seminars, meetings, lectures among uh, medical professionals. We also um, get associated with organizations who want to involve in CME, or CME uh, programs. We uh, encourage printing of books, journals, publishing, publications, and uh, any other uh, activities that help disseminate this um, knowledge among the medical professionals. Uh, it's also a, 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 a platform where we can help uh, those people who are in need of care and also for to create a fund for declaring awards of for pay for people who have ha who have uh, contributed uh, significantly in the fields of medicine and surgery so among among other uh, functions are conducting health camps uh, creating awareness programs uh, carrying out csr activities for the corporates and many other activities predominantly as a non-profit uh, organization uh, and in uh, essentially developing a platform for the academic development of doctors. So with this brief introduction, I would like to start off with the, the program by uh, uh, lighting of a camp, the candle. I'd request Professor Hanif, Dr. Professor Sahai, Mrs. Sahai, and Dr. Uh, uh, Vasant Kumar, sir. to be a part of a very esteemed group of physicians here tonight. So um, I'm Dr. Vrinda. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Kalyan. Um, I am also a consultant endocrinologist uh, at Idea Clinics. Um, so um, I will, um, you know, um, without further ado, I think I'll go on with the evening program here. So I'll introduce our chairpersons for the evening today. So we have uh, Dr. Vasant Kumar, um, who is a senior consultant um, physician and diabetologist, uh, currently affiliated with the uh, Apollo Health City Hyderabad and Apollo Sugar Clinics. He is uh, currently the president-elect um, of the RSSDI and the chairman of the scientific committee for the RSSDI uh, conference for 2021. Um, sir has been very actively involved with the activities of the Association of Physicians of India, uh, where he has been the chairman of the Hyderabad the cha chapter of API and is also currently the um, uh, managing trustee of the API Hyderabad Trust. Um, he was the joint organizing secretary of uh, uh, APICON uh, 2004 in Hyderabad. Um, and then he was also the organizing secretary of the RSSDI annual conference in 2008, um, in 2016, which was held in Hyderabad. He's a very uh, he's um, a very active Rotarian and is also the president of the Dear Diabetes uh, Academy and also the Day Society, which takes care of the children with type one diabetes. Welcome, sir. Um, welcome um, to the evening today. Um, then we have, uh, sir. Please. So um, 
for our uh, second chairperson of uh, for the um, evening today we have dr manisha sahai she is uh, the professor and head of uh, nephrology department at the osmania medical college um, she is the vice president of the indian society of nephrology editor in chief of uh, indian journal of transplantation um, ma'am is a member of um, you know uh, many esteemed uh, professional societies um, she is uh, also uh, the chairman for the south asia regional board um, and has many many uh, achievements uh, including uh, 13 gold medals uh, uh, to um, uh, her credit um, ma'am has been um, cited widely in publications uh, uh, in total about 154 publications in various national and international journals um, she has been invited at multiple uh, national and international societies for guest lectures um, ma'am started actually the cadaver kidney transplant and organ donation program in government sector in Telangana State. So, um, welcome, ma'am. Uh, absolute pleasure to have you here. Um. Thank you. I'll now invite um, you know to carry the evening forward. So, I thank everyone who has joined here today for coming here to the, on this uh, occasion. And uh, it's my proud privilege to introduce Professor Wasim Akram, uh, sorry, Wasim Hanif, <laughs> who's the, the professor of uh, diabetes and endocrinology and a consultant physician and head of service in, di uh, in diabetes in the University Hospital in Birmingham. He's honorary professor of medicine at the University of Warwick. He's the board member of the Center for Diabetes and Endocrine, Endocrine and Metabolism at the University of Birmingham and the Clinical Advisory Group Lead Research in Diabetes and Endocrinology at the Institute of Translational Medicine in Birmingham. He has many, many, he is holding many, many positions in, uh, in various organizations. He was, uh, he's also involved uh, as the chief and principal investigator in the several international and multicentric trials and was also in instrumental in setting up the UK ADS, that is the United Kingdom Asian Diabetes Study. He is uh, very active in the South Asian Health, Fo Health Foundation. He is uh, also a member of the parliamentary and stakeholder diabetes think tank, advising the all-party parliamentary group on diabetes. He is a member of the European Policy Forum on Diabetes, advising the EU. His involvement in NICE has also been very extensive and is sitting on the advisory board of NICE Health Technology Appraisal Committee between 2009 to 15. He is on the expert advisory committee of the Commission of Human Medicine advising MHRA on new medicinal agents. So we are extremely uh, happy to have him here today with us. He is also on the board of governors as a trustee of the Diabetes UK also. And uh, so we are extremely happy that he is with us today and uh, it's my proud privilege to welcome him to this uh, to this program today evening i also uh, worked with him had the pleasure of working with him uh, many many years back about 30 years back uh, when we were both at the nizam institute of medical sciences so welcome to professor hanif welcome. even in the past in some of the national conferences in India, as well as in the IDF. So I must thank uh, Idea Clinics, Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Sham, for giving us this opportunity. Before I ask the learner speaker to take over, I request Dr. Manisha to add a few words. So thank you. It's my proud privilege to share this podium with Dr. Vasim Hanif. So thank you very much, sir. And I'm very excited about the topic. Uh, first thing, excited because we are meeting in person. We are fed up of webinars. I think everybody agrees with that. And it's after so many months that we are meeting here. So despite the sparse ad attendance, I hope other people will also join. And I believe this program is being telecasted as well. So everybody will uh, benefit from uh, his lecture. And regarding the topic, the topic is very interesting. We have been reading about diabetic nephropathy and we knew that there was nothing much we were able to do till a few years ago. And now we have so many new drugs on the horizon. And I'm sure Dr. Hanif would enlighten us about the proper use of those drugs. So over to you, Dr. Hanif. And as I said again, thanks. It's my proud privilege to be uh, chairing 
the podium with uh, Dr. Hanif and uh, Dr. Vasant. Thank you very much. Dignity to first thank my uh, the chairman for today, uh, Dr. Vasant Kumar and Dr. Manisha for the kind invite and coming and chairing the session. A big thank to my good friend and colleague of many years, and we've been in touch, and we do a, still do a lot of work together, Rakesh, uh, Professor Sai. Uh, I and Rakesh not only go back uh, as colleagues, but his parents were my professors in Gandhi. Um, so uh, a big uh, uh, thanks to them, and uh, I think what I am here today uh, is, is because of his parents who were excellent teachers and I'm very grateful to them and please give my namaste to them. Uh, and of course Sham is here as well and Sham and I worked together in the UK. I was trying to hold him back from going back to India. We would know for him a consultant job but he had this passion and he has done some fantastic work here and I'm really really uh, proud of uh, his achievements uh, in Hyderabad where he has brought in some of the work that we've been doing in UK uh, to Hyderabad. So it's, it's, it's great to find uh, a high quality endocrine and diabetes clinic or clinics working in Hyderabad. So uh, well done Sham and we are real, very proud of you and hopefully we, shan, uh, we can continue this um, collaboration together. Uh, so coming to the topic of today, uh, the way I thought I'll probably do it is because this is something um, I was, I've been quite passionate about, diabetic kidney disease. So when I joined the University's Hospitals Birmingham, which is one of the largest foundation trusts in the UK, uh, University Hospital Birmingham is uh, one of the centers that does the largest number of solid organ transplants in Europe. And it has, uh, does a big, big uh, uh, renal transplant, so renal replacement therapy. So we've got a big population of renal replacement as well as renal transplant. When I started as a new consultant, I actually met uh, two people who, 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 who are extremely eminent nephrologists uh, globally now. One is Professor Savage or Caroline Savage, and the other one is Professor Cockwell uh, and Professor Harper. And we talked about what we are going to do in terms of our patients with diabetic nephropathy. Because we were managing their diabetes, they were managing their kidney disease, uh, and there was nothing going on. So we set up uh, uh, what we call a renal MDT, a diabetes renal MDT clinic. And the whole idea was to develop a pathway in which we could manage their diabetes as well as renal disease. So there were two elements or three elements of it. First was to identify patients early on when they develop diabetic um, nephropathy, as we call it then, and have a <coughs> pathway by which we could manage them. The second element of the clinic was to identify patients in which they could have something else other than diabetes causing the kidney disease. And the third element was to uh, was to prepare them for dialysis or renal replacement. And we even did simultaneous uh, kidney pancreas transplant in a lot of our patients. Now, in this uh, 15, 18 years, we have been involved in a lot of clinical trials and a lot of research where, uh, as I said, we tried everything, right from gold to pavigosumab to avacentin to dwell blockade with ACE and ARBs. Uh, without much success. Each of the trials showed that our patients actually ended up dying, 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 dying more than, 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 than before. So what I'm going to try and do is to just encapsulate my journey because I think what has happened in the last two or three years is probably the most exciting thing. And it is about trying to see how we are able to identify and manage these patients. And that is a challenge for us uh, globally. So I'm not going to say you something um, very new in terms of research. I'm sure you, most of you are aware of it. But I'm going to be talking more about the guidelines and pathways and some of the studies that we are really planning to see how we can actually translate all these findings into, into, in, in, into patient benefit. Uh, and, and the reason is this, because I think diabetologists as well as nephrologists, I think 
we are both a bit slow in translating what we do. Uh, when you compare to our cardiology colleagues, now everybody is on a CLT2 inhibitor, even if they have a, the, the mildest of heart failures. But for us, it takes a long time for us to do it because we are skeptics, we look at the evidence. Uh, but I think this is a very good opportunity to see how we can, how we can translate uh, this stuff. Uh, so uh, this is something I found, um, I, I don't know, it was uh, in the hierographics by the Egyptians about diabetes. And somebody told me, and you can count me, this chap's name is Gale, not Chris Gale, the cricketer. Uh, he is the physician from Egypt. And he was supposed to be one of the first few people to identify uh, diabetes. Uh, but one thing unique about Egyptians was, and, and perhaps even the Indian physicians, they thought that diabetes is a disease of the kidneys. And I think they were absolutely spot on in a way. Then we found out it is about pancreas and all. But kidneys is the key uh, in, in diabetes. And I think Manisha will, will agree with uh, me. So this is something we call, uh, copy and always show to the medical students it's all in the we. You've got to uh, concentrate on the, on the we to understand, understand the kidney disease. So these are some of the things uh, I'm going to be covering today overview, risk factors, treatment, uh, and a bit of no doubt. Before we do that, um, let us look at this thing as to what is diabetic kidney disease. The reason why this is very important, and some of the data I will show you will confirm it, is that we have been talking a lot about chronic kidney disease in people without diabetes. And this is especially true in countries like UK with a large elderly population. Uh, where it is now almost mandatory in the NHS to measure the EGFR every year. And as any nephrologist will tell you, as we get older, our EGFRs fall. So all my 80-year-old, 90-year-old will be CKD3 uh, or thereabouts. Uh, but these people will not really progress to, to kidney disease. So I think it's very important, although we identify a lot of chronic kidney disease, we need to see how this is different and how we how we, how we manage that. And then we've got the diabetic kidney disease, which is a subtype of CKD. It is defined as deterioration of the renal function from long-lasting diabetes, usually in the presence of albuminuria. The diagnostic criteria, these are the recommendations from NICE, is two EGFRs of less than 60 over a period of at least 90 days, uh, or EGFR of greater than 60 with an ACR of greater, greater, greater than three. Now, this is the uh, U U.S. data on uh, end-stage kidney disease, and, uh, the, uh, and this is actually shows that the prevalence of the end-stage kidney disease is actually rising. But if you look at the incidence, the incidence is not really changing much. So what it says now is that because we have got better at managing cardiovascular disease, managing uh, decay and other things, uh, our patients are living longer. So more and more of them are actually ending with end-stage kidney disease. So I think it's very important for us to, to start looking and, and managing these patients better. Uh, this is always worries me. Whenever I show any slide on diabetes and its complications, the biggest surge that happens is in Asia. Uh, and this is where most of our battles for diabetes Will be will be four, and you can see the the the, the exponential rise uh, we are seeing in Asia. Although globally there is there is um, there is uh, a thing. Uh, and again, this is something uh, I always show it to the nephrologist, basically telling them that the commonest cause of diabetic kidney disease is uh, of, of kidney disease is or end stage kidney disease is diabetes. Second one is hypertension. Third one is unknown cause, and then comes glomerulonephritis. So it should be the diabetologist who should be well trained in managing diabetic kidney disease, because I think that is something we we have been lacking, or or it has not been uh, it has not been it has not been emphasized. Now, one of the big challenges that we have got is we have got a big population who's all actually on dialysis. Dialysis has. Uh, Two-fold effects. So when it comes to the quality of life, dialysis is probably the biggest uh, 
factor that decreases the quality of life of our patients. Uh, if you look at the colic calculations that are used by NICE and other bodies, somebody having amputation and going blind doesn't lose that much quality of life than someone going on dialysis. So this just emphasizes that what dialysis does to the, to, to the quality of lives. The second important thing, and this is something I always uh, try and emphasize is, somebody who's gone on dialysis, the risk of dying is perhaps higher than some of the cancers. So when somebody has got a cancer, everybody thinks this is terminal, but dialysis per se is, is, is terminal and its prognosis is, is, is worse than, 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 than many, many, many cancers. Once you develop diabetic kidney disease, and this is probably the most depressing slide, you lose about 16 years of your life. So that's a huge amount of life years lost. Again, emphasizing the point that when it comes to diabetic kidney disease, we have to start thinking about it earlier in the management and then and then and then and then and then and then looking looking at it. Now when it comes to what is there in our kind of an armamentarium or the management protocol for diabetic kidney disease, and unfortunately, other than the renal and IDNT clinical trials which were reported in the 90s uh, around 2000, nothing has come up that has shown to, to be effective in terms of uh, altering the course uh, of diabetic kidney disease, and this is this is this is quite 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 depressing. I'm not going to go through it, but just to remind ourselves about the CKD classification, along with thinking about the albuminuria. Now, this again you must have seen is the Kidigo classification, which I uh, think is more suitable where it not only looks at the EGFR but also looks at proteinuria. So somebody having a protein leakage through the kidneys is much more increased risk of, 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 of developing um, or evolving end stage kidney disease. So this is something I always try and emphasize my primary care physicians, diabetologists, please, please measure measure the protein leakage from the kidneys because these are the patients we need to target and treat them more aggressively than the ones that don't have the protein leakage because these are the ones that are going to uh, that they uh, that are going to progress so this is a a, a review we did recently uh, basically trying to look at uh, a couple of things so one of so this is from the thin which is one of the largest databases in the UK and we wanted to look at the prevalence of uh, CKD. And we wanted to look at uh, using two lab EGFRs and CKD calculating the EGFR from creatinine. And what we found was between 2005 to 2009, there was an exponential increase in the patients who have been classified as CKD in, 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 in the UK. Now, when we looked at this data very closely, what we find is that if you look at CKD4 or 5 uh, or even CKD3B, there's not been much difference. And most of this CKD3 has been diagnosed in elderly group of patients. So in which they have a low EGFR, but their protein leakage is not, is, is not there. So this is the natural decline in the EGFR or the GFR you get, which is picked up by the MDRD. But what is uh, more depressing is, if we all know that the ACR testing can actually detect the signs of DKD before significant nephron loss has occurred, and this is something uh, that, is, uh, that is known. But if you look at the measurement, and I'll be showing this uh, data, the measurement of EGFR and albuminuria. So this is, uh, this is the NICE guidelines in which the EGFR should be measured along with the proteinuria. Now people are actually measuring the EGFR very well because it's very easy to measure. And these are the annual care processes, which means that every patient with diabetes in the UK has to have all these things measured. HP1C, blood pressure, cholesterol, creatinine, urinary ACR, fortress surveillance, BMI, smoking history and digital retinal screening. And what we find is among the K processes, the lowest one is the urinary ACR. 
in which when everything is free, the patient is going in, uh, the, the people that don't measure is, 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 is the protein. Again, emphasizing that we perhaps are missing a very important tool in terms of early diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease and its treatment. So therefore, it's, 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 it's very important that we do an HP once your blood glucose always thinks about the uh, uh, protein, 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 protein leakage. So this is the recommendation uh, which I think is, is quite good in terms of the pathway for ACR testing to identify DKD. Uh, it basically says annual assessments of persons with type 2 diabetes send urine for PCR rather than ACR. You can choose either of them is fine. You can do a urine depth stick and if it is positive for blood or white blood cell count then you can consider UTI, renal pathology, uh, treat refer as necessary, repeat DKD screening when appropriate, no proteinuria, repeat screening for DKD uh, in no more than 12 months. And if it's negative uh, uh, or positive for protein only, then you can send for uh, ACR. ACR is less than three. Uh, you measure it on a yearly basis, between three and 70. Uh, then you arrange for an early morning, ensure that the BP is not very high, less than 150, then repeat ACR within three months. And if ACR is greater than 70, uh, then you think about proteinuria. So, uh, so it's not only about measuring the ACR, but having a pathway in which you 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 can see how you manage these manage these uh, manage these patients. I'm not going to go into detail, but this is a slide I always show to a medical students to emphasize the point that when it comes to diabetic kidney disease, the time lag period from the onset of diabetes till you develop end stage kidney disease is about 20 to 25 years. So if any of our patients develop end stage kidney disease, it is the failure of the whole healthcare system because we had nearly 25 years in preventing end stage kidney disease and we somehow were not able to do it. So therefore, it, 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 again, the early identification becomes, becomes very important. Now, whenever we talk about uh, renal disease uh, in type 2 diabetes, um, we somehow tend to concentrate on end-stage kidney disease and the set to you end-stage kidney disease and renal replacement has a huge consequences both in terms of mortality, morbidity and financial this thing for, for our patients. But fortunately, the progression from no nephropathy to microalbuminuria occurs in only about 2% of our patients. From microalbuminuria to albuminuria, another 2.8% of macroalbuminuria to elevated plasma creatinine in, 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 in 2.3. And if you look at the overall patients from no nephropathy uh, to, to, to once requiring renal replacement is just 0.1%, which is very low, but still the number's high. But what is very important is to look at the other hand, and this is why I say diabetes, uh, that diabetes is actually a disease of the kidneys, is as your kidneys get damaged, your risk of dying uh, from, from cardiovascular disease actually tends to increase exponentially. So it's nearly 20-fold higher if you're on renal replacement than in somebody with no nephropathy. So if you've got no nephropathy now, with all the treatments, your risk of dying is only about 10 or 20 percent increase. If you look at the new data from Navid Sattar and the others, it's almost same as the normal population. But once you have a damaged kidney, it increases by 20 fold. So it's not only about kidney disease; it's also about 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 cardiovascular disease. I think we 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 all know the uh, about what is diabetic kidney disease. So we know that. It all starts with hyperfiltration, which can happen in type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, and especially if there is obesity. More glucose is delivered to the nephron, it hyperfiltrates. If anything, the EGFR or GFR actually goes up. Uh, it causes increased glomerular pressure, kidney response with hypertrophy of the epithelium, leading to, 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 to glomerulosclerosis. But what has been more important is to really try and understand what happens to the afferent and the efferent arteriole. And this was where the real, uh, the real 
challenge of, of managing diabetic kidney disease and the failure of so many treatments really, 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 really comes across. So you've got hyperglycemia, you've got globular hypertension. But what is very important is to look at this real structures uh, and to really understand what happens. So we've got the afferent arteriole, we've got the efferent arteriole, we've got the normal filtration pressures going through the ascending limb of lupofenally along the proximal uh, proximal tubule. If you, if you, if a patient develops diabetes and is not on any treatment, poor control of uh, diabetes with hypertension, this leads to the dilatation of the afferent arteriole and constriction of the efferent arteriole, and this happens to protect the kidneys. This leads to uh, further, for, 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 uh, um, uh, this leads to hypertrophy of the glomerulus causing renal release uh, and, 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 and vasodilation. Now in terms of the current treatments that we had for more than two decades was RAS inhibition, which acts on the efferent arteriole and it causes the constrict, it reverses the constriction, so it causes the dilatation of the efferent arteriole in a way protecting the kidneys on one side. What the SGLT2 inhibitors have started doing is the causes the the dilatation of the afferent arteriole is reversed, so they cause the constriction of the afferent arteriole. So on both sides, you 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 get almost normalization, both in terms of afferent arterioles and efferent arterioles. And this is something which was which was which was which was uh, fascinating. And this leads to the glomerular uh, feedback with SGLT2 inhibitors restoring uh, the TGF. This was all very exciting. Um, this was all theory, and uh, I remember having this conversation when we were planning the Credence trial uh, about all the theory. But one of the my concerns was that we had theory for all these agents. We had theory for uh, Roboxysterion, Avacentin, Prefinendione, Siloxide, Alaskarin. Alaskarin was something that was promoted very heavily by uh, Hans Pawing, who was really passionate about it, he wanted to blockade with ACE, ARBs, and Aliskarin. We found increased mortality. Uh, so there was a lot of skepticism in the hope that whether this is if this is going to work or or not or, or not work. We've talked about renal impairment and cardiovascular disease and its increased and its increased risk. So the only treatment that was found to be effective in terms of decreasing the risk of cardiovascular events uh, or, or renal disease was the steno study in which you have a multi multi uh, multiple interventions from blood pressure to cholesterol to diabetes to high speeds and that showed uh, a reduction in terms of nephropathy by 61% but other than that there was there was nothing uh, nothing 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 happening we also had the what we call the legacy effect of diabetes. So this was from the advanced study. And the advanced study, although did not reach its primary end point in terms of decreasing the macrovascular complications, when it comes to microvascular complications, there was a significant reduction in end-stage kidney disease. So we know that by managing the HPA1C tightly in these group of patients who developed proteinuria, there was there was there was there was hope. Uh, and we also found uh, in the ACE inhibitors and ARBs, there was, there, was, there was a renal protection of about 20% risk reductions in renal and IDNT. Now with these in the background, when the, uh, and then there was this whole balawa of uh, using ACE and ARBs together. So we have stopped using it unless in patients who have got a, a great amount of proteinuria despite all interventions in uh, only in this group of patients, we, 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 we tend to use it. For this in the background, we had the Credence study. So this was a, a significant study within SGLT2 inhibitors because this was one of the first studies in which the primary focus was on the renal disease rather than the cardiovascular disease with an SGLT2 inhibitor. Study design, you're all aware of it. It was a kidney trial, which was very exciting. It was not a cardiovascular trial. Uh, inclusion criteria was uh, 
people with diabetes, all of them had diabetes, EGFR 30 to 90, significant proteinuria, uh, and, and, and had to be on ACE. So we were one of the first, uh, one of the centers who were part of the Cretan study, I'm sure a lot of centers were there in India as well. And one of the first things I noticed in my patients who were on the Cretan study, I could identify the ones who were on canagliflozin because their proteinuria was coming down significantly. It never happened to any of the clinical trials. So we were, we, we, we were very excited uh, about, about them. And these were uh, our typical patients that you see, um, mean age of 63 years, 97% had hypertension, half of them had cardiovascular disease. Uh, considering my passion for South Asians, I was happy, although these Asians included uh, uh, all Asians, but nearly 20% of them were of Asian, Asian, a Asian heritage. Uh, significant uh, distribution, much better than previous trials. Nearly 99% were on RAS inhibitors, 70% uh, on statins, uh, the general mix of uh, glucose-lowering treatment. And the primary endpoint was end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, and then renal death and cardiovascular death. The interesting thing uh, that was seen was the separation of the curve started happening at 12 months. And you could see these differences emerging. Uh, about 30% reduction, P extremely significant. Uh, and you can see what I always like in the trials when mentioned the numbers, 340 participants, to 245 showing um, increased numbers. And similarly, when it comes to end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine or renal death, again, uh, showing uh, significant reductions of about 33%. And similarly, when it came to end-stage kidney disease, there was a 32% um, reduction. And dialysis, kidney transplant or renal death, again, 28% reduction. So this is a just a summary forest plot to just give an idea. So right from the primary composite outcome to doubling of serum creatinine, ESKD, age of all less than 15, dialysis, renal death, cardiovascular death, all of them showing, showing positive findings. And again, the concerns around fractures and amputations was not seen uh, with uh, canagliflozin in these really uh, high risk high group of uh, uh, patients. So, so all in all, it was, it was a significant trial, which for the first time showed that a diabetes drug that is used to manage diabetes was showing a significant impact in terms of uh, managing, uh, managing kidney disease. And what really got uh, us excited was the numbers needed to treat. So the numbers needed to treat was the primary outcome was 22, End-stage kidney disease was 28. End-stage kidney disease on its own was, was 43. So these are very, very tiny numbers. Just to give you a perspective for statins, the numbers are around 35, 40 to prevent one cardiovascular death. So these were significantly lower showing, showing the economic benefits. But credence was essentially a diabetes trial in patients who had diabetes to show whether there was a difference. And then we had this trial, the DAPA-CKD study. Now, DAPA-CKD was significant because here, we're using a diabetes drug, an SGLT2 inhibitor, in terms of managing patients both with diabetes as well as without diabetes. So in DAPA-CKD, you had patients greater than 18 years, age of 25 to 75, ACR 200 to 5,000 stable, and these patients were with or without diabetes, so they were treated with either dapagliflozin or placebo, and the composite was sustained greater than 50% EGFR decline, end stage general disease, renal or cardiovascular death, with a lot of secondary endpoints. Again, medical baseline history, you can see nearly 99% were on uh, ACE or R blockade, uh, and nearly 65% were on statins. Nearly two-thirds of the patients had type 2 diabetes, others, others did, not, did, not, did, not, did not have it. Uh, and you could see uh, those with diabetes to, it was nearly uh, a split of two-thirds to one-third. Again, if you look at the primary endpoint, 
<coughs> there was nearly 39% relative risk reduction and numbers needed to treat was 19. Again, showing very, very uh, significant, uh, significant numbers. So if you look at, again, the statistical significance, significance uh, thing in this forest plot when it comes to reduction of EGFR, uh, <coughs> composite of CB death or hospitalization, all favoring SGLT2s. And again, showing this, that there was a significant improvement uh, in terms of uh, the outcomes as well as the side effects were almost, uh, almost minimal, just like the increase of ketoacidosis numerically, but otherwise, um, otherwise uh, quite significant. Now this really brings us into the focus that we have got SGLT2 inhibitors that are very effective in terms of preventing diabetic kidney disease. Now once these findings came in, um, I was involved in a couple of guidelines and one of the challenges was how are we going to use these agents and this was really challenging because you had to show to the primary care physicians where to use it because currently the licenses, as we know, in the UK as well as in India, uh, is that SGLT2 inhibitors were initially licensed as agents for diabetes, which basically means their license was that they should bring down the HbA1c, uh, and that's why you wanted to use them. We also knew once the EGFR was less than 45, because the nephrons were not flushing out the extra glucose, these agents were not very effective in terms of reducing the HbA1c. So the UK guidelines said once the HbA1c was, uh, once the age of R was less than 45, you had to stop these agents. Now we had these two clinical trials, which actually were showing that in the age of R from 45 to 30 or even lower up to 20, uh, in Emperic, uh, which is em kidney, which is not published yet, these agents are effective. So one of, the, one of our major issues was that, how are we going to use it? Where are we going to start it? When are we going to stop it? And what is the indication for using it? Uh, and this, is, this, is, this, is, this, this was uh, quite challenging, and I'll come to that as to how to address this. This is even compounded by the fact that we know that once the EGFR falls to less than 30, our therapeutic choices in the management of diabetes, not diabetic kidney disease, diabetes in patients with, 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 with DKD becomes very limited. Metformin we cannot use because of lactic acidosis, the of 4 of 30. Uh, uh, Sulfonylureas, again, we have stopped using it because of the increased risk of hypoglycemia. Pyoglitazone can be used, but the problem with pyoglitazone is it causes fluid overload. You can never differentiate between heart failure and chronic kidney disease. You're left with insulin, which is, again is, 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 is the last thing somebody wants who's got chronic kidney disease going on dialysis. GLP-1 analogs can be used, but they cause a lot of nausea, uh, especially once the EGFR falls to less than 30. SGLT2 inhibitors, purely in terms of diabetes management, cannot be used because they don't bring down the HP1C, but we had to revisit them in terms of managing it. So we're left with nearly DPV-4 inhibitors or drugs like lenagliptin or alagliptin or, or cetagliptin uh, to use. So this is again uh, something of a, of a dilemma as to how we manage these patients in terms, in, in terms of diabetes. So when it comes to metformin, I think one of the best guidelines I found on metformin are from NICE. And what NICE clearly says is if your EGFR is less than 30, stop metformin and use with cautions between 30 to 45. The risk of lactic acidosis with metformin is extremely low. Uh, we, we, we need to know that. And once uh, the age of R is above 30, 49, because Americans used to not use it, is, 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 is very low. It only increases once the age of R is less than, less than, less than, uh, less than, uh, less than 30. Uh, the other issue that we have got is once the patient goes on either hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or renal transplant, the options even get more limited because you, first of all, if you measure the HP1C, it doesn't give you a proper reading. Secondly, the insulin half-life tends to change on the dialysis and the non-dialysis days. 
So you may end up in a situation where a patient has a hypoglycemia one day and a hyperglycemia the other day. So we have started using more of medium acting insulins like Insultad or Humulinai rather than Lantus uh, uh, or even Lemme, uh, Lantus or um, Deglidec because they have got much half a bigger life in the course thing. Renal transplant has become a big issue because uh, nearly 15% of our patients post renal transplant are developing diabetes and there is very little evidence to show how we manage diabetes in these patients. What are the agents to use? Most of them end up on glycolyzide or insulin again which causes weight gain which affects the transplant choice because the transplant doesn't survive if you, if you start putting on weight. If you started more using GLP-1, again the evidence is less. Again, if these patients are proteinuria, what is the evidence in terms of using SGLT2 inhibitors? And then we've got our patients with SPK. So these are some of the challenges that we have caught. And the question is how are we going to address them? So these are some of the guidelines that we have tried to develop because this is a, this is a very evolving field. And each one of us will have to work together with experts like you to develop their own guidelines in terms of the, of the challenges of, of, of managing diabetic kidney disease. So one of the recommendations that we have got is around EGFR, to check the EGFR of our patients annually, which is important. Along with the EGFR, we need to check the ACR or whatever protein measurements that you use. The target blood pressure is 130, 80 or 125, 75. Using ACE and ARBs as first line treatment, targeting the HbA1c of about 7%, use of statins, and considering uh, aspirin for secondary or primary prevention. And then going down, if the EGFR is greater than 60 or 45, uh, or if it's less than 30, considering referring to uh, a nephrologist, and if his ACR is greater than 100 with blood, again, considering a nephrology referral, and then putting the patients on maximum tolerable dose. So this was our general guidelines, but this is now changed in terms of the current evidence that is, uh, uh, that is uh, available. And this actually starts talking about using SGLT2 inhibitors for two reasons. One is when it comes to the management of diabetes. So you've got to look at the patient's side, are you using for management of diabetes or management of diabetic kidney disease? For management of diabetes, you can use it up to an age of 45 and then consider stopping it. But if the patient has got proteinuria or elevated ACR, then you have to continue using it and going up to an age of 30 or even up to an age of 20. And this is something which is very important where you are moving away from pure diabetes management to the management of diabetic kidney disease. And this is, this is, this is, this is quite transitional. So this is about canagliflozin and it can be applied to the others. If you say it's for reduction in hyperglycemia, reduction in major adverse renal events. So we have talked about MACE, now we are talking about MARE and reduction in MACE. So without severe albuminuria, you can initiate it at an EGFR of above greater than 60 and stop it at, 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 at 45 because there is no benefit in terms of HbA1c reduction uh, and if there is no albuminuria. But if the patient has got severe albuminuria, then you have to consider starting it at any EGFR and continuing it until the patient reaches dialysis or renal replacement. And I think so therefore it is becoming more and more important in terms of how we use the SGLT2 uh, 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 inhibitors. Now we've got our own local uh, Birmingham guidelines in which we have tried to, to incorporate these changes. So now what we say in terms of diabetes management is that once we've used metformin, we go to the second agents. So in terms of second agents, we basically see if the patient has renal disease and that includes any amount of proteinuria 
you start using SGLT2 inhibitors as second line agents, along with, you know, for the cardiovascular benefits uh, and, and for other things. So, coming to the end of my talk, what I think is very important is that diabetic kidney disease is a significant problem. It is going to increase as the patients are living longer. For a very long time, we did not have any drugs in our armamentarium to actually prevent this. To prevent diabetic kidney disease, the important thing is measurement. So I would insist that most of our patients, we should start checking the AGFR along with the AGFR, looking at their ACR. And when we look at the management of the patients, the presence of ACR should dictate the choice of therapy. Uh, be it in terms of SGLT2 inhibitors, maximum doses of ACE inhibitors, and the and the others. So, the whole scenario of uh, diabetic kidney disease, right from the prevention and um, early detection, and of course the management. And the topic on diabetic kidney disease cannot end uh, without talking about SGLT2s. Uh, you have extensively dealt with it, but in spite of that, I'm sure there will be points. And then I have. My coach, too, is going uh, to give her comments, yeah. which are very important to all of us. Yeah. So thank you. I second Dr. Vasan's opinion. Very lucid presentation from etiology, pathogenesis, to the recent advances in management. So just to add to what you said, sir, I would like to give you the Indian scenario. Yeah. So in India also, we do a lot of dialysis. We are not happy doing it. As you said, it's a failure of primary treatment itself. And uh, we do transplants as well, and we do simultaneous uh, kidney pancreas transplants as well. So the technology, the know-how, everything is available. But the sad part is that we are focusing on wrong things. Yeah. We are not focusing on prevention. Absolutely. So in India, we keep on emphasizing, in nephro conferences, we have audience as nephrologists. Yeah. In endocrine conferences, we have audience as endocrinologists. Yeah. In diabetic conferences, RSSDA, we have all most of the people diabetologists. These people are already aware of the drugs. But who sees the patient in the early part? The Primary general care. practitioners, maybe the physicians. Yeah. And they do a very yeoman service because yeah. with the Indian population, we need all of us to work together. Patient should be treated as a whole, a holistic yeah. approach. So what you said, that to use all these drugs, we have to first pick the patient early, yeah. not pick the patient when he comes to the nephrologist Absolutely. in stage four or stage five. So that thing needs to be emphasized. All diabetic patients every year should have a measurement of creatinine and EGFR and the proteinuria. Either you do a protein creatinine, which is freely available, yeah. or a UACR. So that should be the take home message. Yeah. Yeah. So we should pick them up early to use these drugs appropriately. So we were also a part of the credence trial, sir. Our yeah. center was also yeah. part of that trial, and the drug gave phenomenal effects. Yeah. So though it was a blinded study, we could yeah. easily make out yeah. the patients who Absolutely. were on the study drug. Yeah. Apart from being a nephroprotective drug, a smart diuretic. I mean, yeah. the edema goes off. Yeah. Many of the times we had to stop the diuretic as well. So these drugs are very important tools in the armamentarium for treatment for diabetes, apart from the RAS blockhead. Yeah. And now we have other drugs as well. Yeah. But SGLT2, I would like to call it the molecule of sure. the decade for yeah. all of us. Yeah. So uh, with that, I would like to open open the uh, topic for discussion. So any questions from the floor? Dr. Hanif, it's a good presentation. Uh, I just want to have one question. I'm Dr. Jay Prakash. Uh, you have a diabetic patient, non-hypertensive. At what level of EGF, EGFR should we start ACE inhibitor as a primary level prevention? ICE guidelines. Uh, I remember this uh, very good adage which one of my professors, Professor Tony Barnett, who I trained in and is a world famous chef, he used to say uh, that if you, he used to, I think most people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, are going to get, become hypertensive at some, at some point. Now the targets that NICE gives us is around 140, 90, 140, 80 as, as the target when you start using ACE inhibitors in all people with diabetes, irrespective of whether they have kidney disease or they don't have kidney disease. And this is essentially to protect the heart as well as the, as well as the kidneys. But if they develop any amount of proteinuria, any amount of uh, um, even microalbuminuria, 
I would be temp tempted to use ACE inhibitors and, uh, and ARBs. In my practice, I usually tend to use something like losartan at, uh, at a small dose of 50 milligrams uh, uh, to, to, to try and uh, look at the proteinuria, but you can use ACE inhibitors and go to, go to the big dose. So I think any increase in blood pressure uh, or any proteinuria would, would, would point me in towards using an ACE or ARB. So just to add to that, sir, in mm. India, the dose, maximally tolerated dose, if Absolutely. not the maximally recommended dose. Absolutely. So people are scared of hyperkalemia, which should not be there. Yeah. Now we have so many trials that the RAS blockade can be continued in advanced CKD as well, yeah. provided you yeah. are able to take care of the hyperkalemia. Yeah. So I think that also is an important part, at least in our country, sir. No, no, absolutely. I, I, uh, Ramipril, uh, the only reason for that is it was almost impossible to titrate it to 10 milligrams, which is the best dose. So we started with 1.25, and most patients would end on 2.5. One thing about hyperkalemia, uh, and I'm sure you, you, would, uh, you, 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 you would recommend as a nephrologist, what my nephrologist colleagues uh, tell me I find useful, first of all, Hyperkalemia, if the sample is lying for a very long time, they will develop hyperkalemia. Secondly, in patients with chronic kidney disease, anything above six doesn't excite me. Because one of the things, once we finish our clinic, we get about 10 calls from the labs. So now we have said anything above six doesn't excite me. So this is something we have to be aware of. Because sometimes hyperkalemia somehow drives uh, agents not to use it. Now you've got newer agents which can be used for hyperkalemia. Uh, but I think getting them to the top dose of ACE. Now the other thing which I have noticed about ACE inhibitors, and especially this happened during the pandemic, during the COVID times, is that once the patient develops AKI or develops sick day rules, they stop the ACE inhibitors and they never restart it again. Now one of the things that I always tell all my patients is that if you're on ACE inhibitors and similarly with SGLT2, if you develop um, diarrhea, vomiting, are admitted to the hospital, develop some kind of an AKI, pause the agents, don't stop it, pause it. And once you recover it, go back on it because that is going to save the life of the patients both in terms of cardiovascular and renal things. The use of metformin in diabetic kidney disease, especially in relation to Indian population. Indian population, uh, as you know, the low BMIs, young diabetics, and uh, more of insulin deficiency. So my concern is when if I have to use metformin in some of these DKD patients whose um, GFRs may not be too low, but even if it's say around 50, uh, the concerns are the high dose uh, tolerance to it. I would in so should I use a smaller dose of metformin? or stop it, or would insulin be a better choice? Yeah, good question, and uh, I wish we had the evidence to really answer that. But generally, I think if the BMI in, is, is less than 25, uh, if you're going to use metformin, because some of these patients have BMI of 23, I would probably not use metformin more than 500, especially if the EGFR is less than 45. Because beyond that, there is very little effect in terms of HPA1C, but more effect in terms of increasing the complications and stuff like that. So I would go in the GFR45 and, and stop there. Uh, I'm not sure what you think, Manisha. Yeah. So I think metformin up to 30, mm. but 30 to 45 cautious. Yeah. So again, the doses go down and all that. Yeah. So that, and lactic acidosis, uh, more commonly reported with Finformin. We have yet to see a case of lactic acidosis with metformin yeah. in our whatever small experience. Yeah. So metformin seems to be a good drug, but as uh, Sir said, we have to take the precautions and use it. Yeah. Then the second drug we are adding now, and I think most of us are, is GLT2 inhibitors. They are being added. Only thing, some questions, what we get, as you already highlighted, the sick day rules. So yeah. the drug gets a bad name if we don't use it properly. So we should know when to use it and also know when not to use it. So those things yeah. you highlighted. Yeah. One thing what people generally do is they start the patient on SGLT2 inhibitor and when the GFR goes down below 30, they stop it. Yeah. So the guideline doesn't say that. It says when you are starting the GFR about 30 and as you said, after more trials, empa kidney it may yeah. go down to 20 as yeah. well. 
So if you put the patient on that and the GFR goes down, as it will, because yeah. it decreases after starting these drugs, yeah. we need to continue. Yeah. And as you said, till they go on dialysis or till the patient becomes yeah. azotemic. So yeah. we continue that drug. No. No, no, I, I really get um, very often, and we're good to get your views, is you see when you start ACE inhibitors and if the EGFR falls more than 20%, the general recommendation is stop the agent because you're thinking about renal artery stenosis. People generally ask when you start an SGLT2 inhibitors, you get a fall in EGFR about 20%. Should we stop the agent? The answer is no. Because SGLT2 inhibitors per se don't cause any kidney complication. There was a subgroup analysis from Credence that showed in patients who EGFR dropped by more than 30 or 40%, these patients do badly, but that's a very small group of patients. And with the SGLT2 inhibitors, at least in my practice, I'm not sure, in yours, I've not seen those kinds of drops. So with the SGLT2 inhibitors, drop in EGFR, please don't stop the agents. I think um, most of these, you pick up all kinds of things, so things like UTIs, hyperkalemia, and all that. So it was more of that. But it wasn't anything that would really worry me. Overall, severe side effects are 25 percent. It is mentioned. I think again, uh, this you see in terms of the clinical trials, most of the serious side effects would include almost anything that would happen to the patients. You know, so these are very vulnerable group of patients. So any kinds of SAE or serious adverse event happens, that is that will be that will be reported. But there are not any specific that would cause the concern. Uh, Dr. Hanif, uh, to complications of diabetes, uh, though significant patients with microalbuminuria might end up with raised creatinine and uh, a few of them with end stage renal failure. Are there any predictors? Not everyone with microalbuminuria would ha end up with. Uh, significant kidney disease. How do we judge? In analogy, if you have retinopathy, though most patients might have bilateral retinopathy, very few will end up with laser treated uh, retinopathy in only one eye. Are there many local factors or is it all metabolic? Why would that uh, not? How do we predict end stage kidney disease in uh, patients with microalbuminuria? I think that's a challenge. So a lot of research, as you're aware, is going in, in into what we call precision medicine now, which basically is trying. So you see, when we talk about type 2 diabetes, we talk about the whole group of patients. But we know that some of our patients don't develop any complications. They may develop diabetes at a, at, 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 at a later stage in life. They don't develop any complications. Then we have got patients who are obese. There was this Swedish paper that looked at classification. There was another paper from Dr. Mohan, again, looking at how we classify type 2 diabetes. Now, when it comes to complications, especially microvascular complications, it's very difficult for us to look and classify the group of patients that will go on and develop these complications. Now, one of the only things, and this has been study, uh, shown by a number of studies, is the serial measurements actually helps us. So if somebody has got microalbuminuria, uh, a single microalbuminuria wouldn't excite me. But if you keep on measuring every year, if the microalbuminuria is increasing, so if you have got 100 patients with microalbuminuria, a third will become albuminar normal albuminuric, a third will remember, remain microalbuminuric, and the third will progress. So just to identify those group of patients in whom the albuminuria actually progresses. And these are the group of patients that you want to treat aggressively. Now, one of the challenges that we have got uh, in India, because I'm working with, with, with various parts of the country, is in the UK, when you have got somebody with diabetes, that patient is tied to his GP because they have got access to free health care. So they are called every year by the GP to have the test. If they don't come, the GP harasses them because the GP doesn't get paid if this patient doesn't have the test. So we have got a cohort of the patients that are, man, are, are monitored very closely in the primary care. The challenge we have got here is in a large group of patients, they access healthcare through different centers at different point of time. 
So they may go to a cardiologist and have their albumin creatinine measured, and then they may go to a diabetologist, then they may go to a nephrologist. And therefore, this is, this is probably one of the challenges that we have to really look into <coughs> at a policy level, where we have got some kind of data sharing uh, among various labs and various other places with electronic records that actually starts linking this medical data. I think we are due to have the India-UK healthcare conferences where uh, I think uh, one of the speakers last year and, and again this year is, uh, forgetting his name, he, he, he heads the Ayushman Bharat. And one of the things that they've been talking about is big data. So which big data basically means either through biometric or Aadhaar card or something where your medical records can be linked so that the people are able to go with their records to, to various people and, and to share them, especially post-pandemic, we need those kinds of things. But because without that, it becomes quite quite challenging. And this, I, uh, I'm, I will be great to hear from you all as to how you feel about that. So you Indian system very nicely, sir, probably <laughs> because you have worked here. Yeah. So that's the major challenge. I mean, uh, there is no hierarchy. The yeah. patient doesn't move from a GP to a maybe Still, physician yeah. or the physician should be at the core center and then yeah. should refer. But in India, the policy is anything, some vague pain, the patient rushes to the cardiologist. And as you very lightly mentioned, ECG, 2D, everything is done, mm. but sometimes the urine yeah. protein or creatinine is missing. Absolutely. Because with super specialization, there comes a tubular vision. Yeah. So we should look at the patient as a whole, and this somehow does not happen. I'm not saying cardiologist, it happens with all the specialties. Yeah. So in fact, like some of the patients present with vomiting in advanced stages of renal failure, urine output may be good. They go to the cardiologist, endoscopy, all scopy, are done but creatinine is missing sometimes yeah. so same thing I mean as you said it should be through the proper system otherwise it's very difficult and big data people are trying to do it now in India and uh, many of the EMRs are being developed but it's again in bits and pieces it should be at the national level and the data entry should be mandated yeah. and should be linked with the payment yeah. otherwise I mean that is the only thing which yeah. works in India yeah uh, I think because the only way the data collection improved in the UK was when it was linked to the payment because if you don't have the data, you're not going to get paid. And that's where the GP started engaging more with the patients. Because without the payment, it's, it, it's, it's not going to be there. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges we face as diabetologists, nephrologists, is, is when it comes to the prevention arm. Because the prevention arm requires the lowest investment, has got the greatest return, greatest benefit for the patient, but the incentive is not there. So people want to do SPK and they want to do kidney transplants because that's, you know, that's, that's supposed to be very interventional. Uh, but that doesn't get the buck for the money because till then it's too late for the patient. It might benefit that individual patient, but uh, for, for, for a maximum number of patients, it is the prevention element of it which is going to be very important. Practice I have seen uh, this runs in families only. Yeah, absolutely. Three sisters, all the three sisters going and the third sister was predicting, now my elder sister has uh, now died and now I am also going to yeah. die in this only, I don't want to take this. I feel, is there anything, is it related to food? Is it related to phosphorus or uric acid? People who are red, red meat eaters sure. only go into early or those who drink more milk only go into yeah. this. So, so I, th I think that's a, that's a good quote by one of my colleagues called Professor Steve Bain. He did it in uh, type 1 diabetes. So this was called the, um, it was called the 50 year study. So basically he, he looked at all patients with type 1 diabetes who had lived for more than 50 years with type 1 diabetes. And then he went around the country collecting the data from them and to find out who were the ones, looking at all kinds of things. Looking at the risk of developing kidney disease and whether they're surviving and stuff like that. So the, the thing he found was two things which were very important. So, so these were the patients who did not develop kidney disease. Yeah? So because they lived with type 1 diabetes for 50 years, did not develop kidney disease. So the only thing he found when it came to the others who developed kidney disease and died was the HbA1c was no different, blood pressure was no different. This was a long time back. 
the usage of drugs was no different. The only thing that was different was HDL. HDL was higher in these group of patients. And the second thing that was significant was there was some kind of familial association. So there was a genetic risk of developing kidney disease. And we see it in a lot of our type 2 diabetes patients. I am not aware of whether you are aware of any link with food, because I think food intake doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, but it is, uh, there is definitely a genetic linkage. There is perhaps, you know, all these things do add up. So although some patients are protected, in some patients things like HPA1C, blood pressure, and all do add up. Be with me. Thanks to Dr. Vasim. We have really revisited diabetic kidney disease, every aspect of it. And um, thanks to Dr. Manisha. Without you, it would not have been so informative and lively. But the combination of both of you really worked well for all of us. And uh, thank you, Idea Clinics, for giving us this opportunity. I'll hand you over to Dr. Rakesh and then to the sponsors. I, uh, so, uh, I think before concluding, I think the, the, there is one video and uh, Joydeep wants to talk about big data and uh, something. Let's wind up quickly. While we wait for that, I always wanted to know from Vasim, uh, what is that one quality? Because quite a few of us went to the UK, we were like ordinary. What is that one quality that has really made you be what you are and while we struggled to survive? I really wanted to know. I think you, you all uh, have got... Uh, uh, I think one of the important things which I think for all uh, of us uh, is that uh, I think I have always felt if you want to do in medicine, I think you need a certain amount of passion. I've always had this uh, passion of making a difference uh, uh, to, to my patient. I, I remember this conversation which played a very significant point of, uh, in my life uh, with a very eminent uh, physician and he said you got to keep your patient in the center because in the UK you see we feel a, uh, we, we face a lot of pressures from managers, from researchers basically looking at budget management, looking at medicines management, looking at what you do it. And what he said was that if you keep your patient on your side, you will always succeed, you know, in, in whatever you do, be it research, be it clinically, be it everything. Because if the patient is not on your side and then you're trying to uh, look at either, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong in making money, but making money or saving money, then in the long term you will lose out. But if you, if you have got your patient on your side, so I think that is the thing, but I, I think you are as successful or probably more than me. <laughs> Thank you. What we will do is uh, just winding up uh, the final session. I think uh, who is going first? Healthcare. And last decade with technology, there is disruption, which is good, but it is upsetting the balance of healthcare. Lot of piecemeal stakeholders are coming in. The pharma industry, the diagnostic te technology. I think it's not a healthy environment. So, what ideally, it's to, India is uh, full of data. We, if we can work our act, get our act together, I think we can create a lot of data. We can be the big. Uh, uh, in that context, what we are trying to do is uh, build the database, understand it's not just the clinical care. We have to have analytics, we have to have predictor models, uh, recommendation engines. That's what UK has. Uh, uh, you have a big database. Uh, when it came to COVID, they were spot on. They could come up with studies with that uh, whatever we did. Here, hardly anything existed. And uh, is it ready? Yeah. Yeah. About Idea Clinic's journey and what Idea Clinic is going to do in very soon. Uh, so I'm Joydeep. Uh, I'm the business head for Idea Clinics. I'll just take you uh, to the journey, uh, what we are uh, planning to do and what we are already doing. Uh, as uh, Dr. Hanif was talking about big data, the digitization, those aspects. So at Idea Clinics, uh, with Dr. Sham's vision, keeping the doctor in the central, where uh, keeping everything around the doctor and the patient, we have bu started building the system, the processes, the technology, 
and the analytics where doctor and the patient are connected all the technology is facilitating connecting us with the data in the form of the patient's data that we are getting in the form of clinical data that we are getting so we are connecting everything in this space if you can see over here the technology analytics and the systems and processes so what we want to do is we want to make the work for all the doctors the clinics which are running all across the country to make their work very very easy through the technology where they get the access to the entire network which you can see over here so basically a doctor is meeting the patient then the doctor is writing the prescription where <coughs> services where lab services home services pharmacy and this entire platform is completely secure for the uh, for the doctor to use which we are building in the form of the technology this is going to be the idea clinics own technology which is going to help the doctors the clinics to run their operation seamlessly as their own business as their own practice that is what we are building and very soon i mean in next few days maybe on the ganpati day we are going to release our first version of our software which is going to be the platform of its kind from idea clinics again as i said it's very important for us to keep the doctor in the central and provide the service delivery very very easy for the patients to access the doctor thank you uh, dr sham sorry danis uh, in our system all the revenue a portion of it will go into the doctor as well so it is a self funding uh, so that model we built so that all stakeholders get benefited so if i see a patient uh, yeah instant uh, that sort of uh, so that we have everything in one place uh, and the growth platform is secured whatever uh, technology and analytics we are building that i think hopefully if luck is on our side we can probably uh, create some value over to you yes yes and it is might be worth considering uh, with you all is there is uh, a lot of uh, funding that is available from mrc welcome in terms of um, grants so recently i am actually chairing um, a project called the ornate project so this is a 8 million pound grant from mrc welcome uh, it's uh, and this basically is looking at diabetic retinopathy screening for preventing blindness and that kind of uh, uh, research is basically going in with the cameras taking pictures and stuff like so that project is very much complete but this is something about data data integration big data is a of lot of interest because one of the things that can be put in together is using either your smartphones because in india everybody has got a phone so if that could be linked together and a model can be worked out by yourselves then it can be rolled out to other places and stuff like that so we can have a chat uh, any time and we can we can see whether uh, we can put it together because in birmingham we have got a <coughs> very big team on, on which is actually working on big data trying to uh, put these things together sir and convince sir i'll put that back bro the sidman group uh, uh they they in the last minute they volunteered to come up and sponsor this event and uh, thank you again thank you. let's break for dinner thank you yeah and this is a mumbai based organization sir uh, which we are into pharma and in to health technology company and uh, we are uh, presently we are into metabolics and uh, cardiology we are furthering into the nephrology oncology and ai based uh, genetic testing tools uh, we have an a tie up with a company called advanced soft initiative which is in a software company based out of uh, chicago with a uh, last 20 years uh, especially they are have an arm called uh, try second opinion this is a second opinion uh, platform uh, across the globe which they are working and they want to venture even into the india where we have a tie up uh, and this is uh, the same organization is uh, working into the 
virtual physical examination, uh, especially for the remote uh, auscultation and the ECG also. And uh, Advanced of, uh, Soft is working with uh, AI-enabled uh, genetic testing tools uh, insight into the more prevalent uh, diseases. Uh, this is with regard to our Sigmund Life Senses. Uh, and uh, we have uh, all the products uh, which we will, uh, all the physicians and diabetologists uh, you will be using in day out by name Practomat, uh, which is a metformin. And we have with the uh, glimipred and metformin uh, combinations. Uh, and with Voglibose, which we will be using uh, Practomat VG1 and VG2. And Practozide is the glycolazide. And Daflosid is the Dapaglifosone, uh, which already Sarah has spoken very length about it. Uh, we offered it a uh, very lucrative price to the patients. Uh, and Telmisorton, uh, the Telsid is our brand uh, with the Chlorithelidone and Rosvastatin. And Rosvastatin with the Clopidogrel. Seed Rose is our brand uh, and Atorcid is our Atorvastatin. Atorcid CV and uh, Seed 60K is the vitamin D3, which we have. Uh, 60,000 international unit uh, and we are for a diabetic in uh, peripheral neuropathy we have and this is a uh, Sidner and PG and uh, thank you. Sidman is reaching out uh, experts and renewed uh, specialist uh, towards our uh, endeavor and we need your blessings and uh, helping and uh, we are at a infancy. So uh, last two decades I have been calling uh, from MR days, uh, Vasan sir, Rakesh sir, uh, all I need uh, help uh, from you sir. Thank you sir. Thanks for the opportunity.